thank you so much for coming out this afternoon to a new venue. We've never had an event here before, but we think it's a lovely place, and I hope it's the beginning of a tradition. I'm Johanna Blakely. I'm the Managing Director and the Director of Research at the Norman Lear Center, which is based at the Annenberg School for Communication. Uh, this event is part of an ongoing initiative called Creativity and Collaboration in the Academy. It's sponsored by the Vice President of Research, Randy Hall, who is here today in the green shirt. Um, and it's carried out, for the most part, by the Norman Lear Center. Our goal is to promote more and better collaborative research at USC and to make sure that faculty and students are taking full advantage of the broad range of new technologies that enable new forms of collaboration and brand new types of scholarship. We held a series of faculty workshops in the spring of 2010, which culminated in a full day conference in December of that year. I wanted to play for you just a short little two-minute overview uh, video uh, with an overview of the issues that we discussed there. I think at least in the humanities, many of us don't want to collaborate. Um, many of us come into the field because we love going into a quiet room and working with objects that stay the same from century to century. <laughs> Collaboration is essential to making progress. It's very hard to get uh, scientists to spend the time needed to generate the very detailed metadata that's important for people to have before they can use these digital objects. And so clearly the interplay of people and their ideas is a really critical piece of innovation. Because when you move to online publishing, you move away from the economy of scarcity, yes. which requires you to toss 90% of the articles out on the top simply because you know you don't have the pages. Saul Galab used to say that the way you could tell you had moved from one discipline to a neighboring discipline is when people start saying, that's not research. <laughs> <laughs> the, the nature of collaboration across you know, fields and across you know, disciplines, across people, you know, is very heterogeneous. You know. What about people who create online repositories, online tools for scholars in the field, infrastructures for collaborative research, games, uh, websites? All those things are acts of digital scholarship. Just as peer review needs to develop models so that you get credit for different aspects of review, you could imagine that data curation becomes something that we track and award credit for. You want to distinguish between um, the tools that you use to discover new knowledge and the knowledge that's discovered using those tools. We want our young scholars to be risk takers and to be bold. I wish post-tenure was as ideal as you guys are making it. <laughs> the thing that we have to always be cognizant of uh, is that our own conservatism based on the past does not drive our future and that uh, we have to go back to the basic principle that as a university we're all about uh, creating knowledge and disseminating knowledge and the issue is how do we do that best and stay at the top of that game. It was a terrific conference and uh, in fall 2011 we began bringing speakers like Christine Borgman whom we have here today to campus to inspire us with their research. We've had John Wilbanks here to discuss the Science Commons. Uh, Lev Manovich came from UC San Diego to talk about his data visualization projects. And our very own Warren Bennis uh, gave a great talk about the necessity for collaboration in innovation, which is really one of the core elements of this initiative. I urge you to visit our website. It's usc.edu slash creativity where you can read a transcript of the day-long conference, you can look at the results of the workshops, faculty workshops that we held across campus, watch videos, and we also have these amazing illustrations that were created by our graphic recorder, Lloyd Dangle, who attended the day-long conference and actually uh, created illustrations of the issues that we, uh, that we chewed over there. We also have a Twitter feed, of course. Uh, it's called USC Creativity, of course, just one word. And we'll be using that to tweet the conference today. If you're tweeting today, uh, we'd ask that you please tag your posts with at USC Creativity, and we will retweet them. Now, maybe you saw in the New York Times yesterday the review of the Idea Factory. A uh, new book by John Gertner, the editor of uh, Fast Company magazine. The reviewer was Walter Isaacson, who used to be the editor of Time magazine. Now he's in charge of the Aspen Institute. And he said something in his review 
that could have been ripped directly from the transcript of our Creativity and Collaboration conference. It was this. The Idea Factory explores one of the most critical issues of our time. What causes innovation? Why does it happen? And how might we nurture it? The lesson of Bell Labs is that the most feats of sustained innovation cannot and do not occur in an iconic garage or the workshop of an ingenious inventor. They occur when people of diverse talents and mindsets and expertise are brought together, preferably in close physical proximity, where they can have frequent meetings and serendipitous <coughs> encounters. Events like this are meant to accomplish exactly that. So we're not only planning to talk today about what we can do to be more innovative in the university. By bringing all of you together, we hope to see new projects and partnerships emerge, the kind that magically appear over coffee and pastries, which are two often overlooked but key ingredients for innovation <laughs> over there in the corner. So we'll have those waiting for you uh, at the reception that follows the Q&A after uh, Christine's talk. Now, as Carl Kesselman keeps telling me, big data is really hot right now. Right? I always think of Zoolander when I say that. So, of course, we're thrilled to have Christine Borgman here to speak with us today. She's professor and presidential chair in information studies at UCLA. She's the author of more than 200 publications in the fields of information studies, computer science, and communication. Both of her sole authored monographs, Scholarship in the Digital Age, and From Gutenberg to the Global Information Infrastructure, both from MIT Press, won the Best Information Science Book of the Year Award. She is a lead investigator for the Center for Embedded Network Systems. It's a science and technology center funded by the NSF, where she conducts data practices research. Her current collaborations include Monitoring, Modeling, and Memory, and the Data Conservancy, both funded by NSF as well as a brand new project funded by the Sloan Foundation called The Transformation of Knowledge, Culture, and Practice in Data-Driven Science. She's a member of the Board of Directors of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. She's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And she recently completed seven years of service on the US National Academy's Board on Research Data and Information. In 2011, she received both the Paul Evan Peters Award from the Association for Research Libraries and the Research and Information Science Award from the American Association of Information Science and Technology. Today, she'll discuss the changing nature of scholarship and help us make sense of the data sharing imperative. So please join me in welcoming Christine Morgan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Um, and thank you, Marty Kaplan. And thank you, uh, Randy Hall, also for your very well-timed piece in uh, the Chronicle of Higher Ed on just this point as well. I will uh, try to cover a number of these topics that were in your, uh, your, in your conference. And I think the, the point that, uh, that Randy made here about creating an infrastructure for the wide sharing of research and data is, is pretty much sort of the, the main theme of, of what I want to talk about. Uh, we don't do as much across town between the Bruins and the Trojans as, as we might, uh, but we did coordinate on your first event of the year with John Wilbanks. We timed it so John could talk to my class at USC as well as being over here. So I think we're doing more things together than we may, uh, may readily acknowledge. All right, so um, with, with that, so here is my cover slide. And uh, I have a very large research team, and this is among our data and data practices team that we've been working with for about 10 years now at, uh, at UCLA. So let me just jump right on in, because I want to leave plenty of time for discussion and talk about the data deluge, which is drowning all of us. And it's drowning not just scholars, but librarians and, uh, and data archivists. And much of this data uh, deluge really is runoff. Okay? It's not being captured. It's not being saved. And what we're wrestling with in uh, an infrastructure for scholarship is determining what to select, what to keep, and how to make it useful. What, what are the tools and services that we really need? Uh, which brings us to the problem of what are the data? And Carl gave me a very good example earlier of simple things like, how do you measure blood pressure? 
Well, did you get it measured at your doctor's office, at home, at the, uh, at the, the nearby uh, drugstore? Uh, and we use examples like what, uh, what is the local temperature, and the, some of the computer scientists and the embedded network sensing will say just temperature is temperature, and yet when you talk to the biologists on the team, they will tell you there's a hundred ways to measure temperature, and they need to know precisely which one of those was involved. This uh, report from the National Science Board in 2005 uh, was a key one, a whole series of large public policy reports around, uh, around questions of what are data. And they did come out with these four categories of observational, experimental, computational, and records, but even there showed many, many other little things that might be data. At the high level, they acknowledged that the observational data are the ones that people are most likely to want to keep. Uh, given that you can never go back and get those same data again. The experiment you can do again, the computational models you can do again. We've been interviewing scientists in a number of fields for about 10 years now about what, what kind of research they do and what kind of data they produce. And we spent about the first you know, 15, 20 minutes getting them warmed up, getting to understand what their research is about before we hit them with this question of what are your data. And that turns out to be much more of a showstopper than you might think. Then they start scratching their heads and saying, well, is, is it the numbers coming off the sensor? Is it the spreadsheet? Is it the calibrated numbers? Is it the table that's in my publication? Just what of that is actually the data? And then you ask two or three people on the same team, and they will each give you their own answers for what are the data. Then you say, well, who owns it, who shares it, who should release it? And they may not even have thought about it. Questions of, of who is an author of the data. And it gets more and more complicated as we go on. I have students in my courses on data and data practices go out to work with faculty to help them develop data management plans. And uh, by the end of a 10-week term, they're supposed to produce a plan. I ask them at the end of winter term, how long did it take you to figure out what are their data? You know, week one, week two, week three. It seems to be week four, week five, sometimes in the humanities particularly, it's about week eight before they really had a sense of working with these people of what they thought the data were that might need to go into that data management plan which makes, makes one question these models that librarians are using for giving a one-hour interview with faculty to ask them what data should go into their data management plan. It takes a lot more than talking to people for one hour to figure out just what those data might be. Given how messy all of this is, why is it that we've got this massive push toward re requiring data management plans and requiring people to share. The National Science Foundation, uh, all proposals starting January 2011, have to have a two-page data management plan. And that plan has to go into the peer review process, which itself is, is something uh, new that's been added here. Um, they have had the data sharing requirements for a very long time. The data management plan is what was added just this last year. Welcome Trust is the biggest one in Britain. They have it. I find this one of the ESRC to be the most interesting because they not only require you to share, but your proposal is supposed to say why there are no other data already existing that you could reuse. And then they require you to offer the data at the end of your project back to a repository that's funded by this agency. But the library doesn't have to take it. The librarians and the archivists, and Claude will be in charge of this for you most likely, um, get to say, does this data meet appropriate levels of quality? So we've got selection and appraisal criteria being built into this whole process, just like we have a peer review process built in uh, built in for the public